ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 128. Science Faction, the fallacy fallacy. If I just walked in the room right now, I would think this was a gay porn podcast. I like it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Damien, why don't you think about the other gender's perspective for I once? I didn't say I didn't like it either. Dr. <laughs> Amy and I are very equally aroused, separate but equally aroused. She jumped the phallic gun on you, if you will. Exactly. Uh, if you guys haven't been listening recently, after we ran out of the periodic table of the elements, each one of our science faction episodes is now starting out with a different logical fallacy. The logical fallacies, of course, are inherent fallacious arguments that you make because there's a problem with the argument itself. So, this case, the fallacy fallacy is one of my favorite ones because it actually is somewhat self-reflexive. So we've talked about a lot of the logical fallacies up to now. The slippery slope was one of the last That's slope. offensive. There are Asian listeners on this podcast. I know if you've listened to it before and if you're Asian, sticking up for Asians usually is in this show's <laughs> bit. But today we take a stand. Slippery slope. <laughs> they have perfectly traction feet. How dare you? <laughs> I don't care how greasy he was. <laughs> uh, we talked about the ad hominem fallacy, all those other ones. The fallacy fallacy is a very interesting one. It is the fallacious argument of claiming that somebody else's conclusion must be false because they used a logical fallacy in their reasoning. So this is interesting because you might be thinking, well, wait, haven't we been talking about how logical fallacies are inherently flawed and thereby can't be used in good rhetorical discussion? Yes, that's true. But, as we all know, sometimes bad arguments can still lead to true conclusions. And so you can't automatically say somebody's conclusion is false just because they argued it a bad way. So, like, a good example of it, if you had somebody making the claim, I speak English, therefore I am English, then somebody else could make the fallacy fallacy by saying Americans and Canadians, among others, speak English too. But by assuming that speaking English and being English always go together, you have committed the package deal fallacy, which is true, you have. The package deal. See, now we're into a gay porn thing. This is a very <laughs> sensual episode. Cheap gay porn. What a deal. <laughs> and saying, well, because you committed this package deal fallacy, you are incorrect. Therefore, you are not English. Now, the argument is bad. It's a fallacious argument. But it doesn't mean that that person still could not indeed be English. So you're conclu- you can't decide that just because they made a logical fallacy in their argument that their conclusion is necessarily false. What you can say is you need to restart and try and argue your point again from a non-logical fallacy perspective. It also matters when you said that, because what counts as English now might not be counting as English in a few months' time. That's right. That's right, yo. Because you might be Scottish, for example. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And speaking of Scottish, I am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Ricardo. Damien, how are you doing? I just realized I don't really hold your feet to the fire for a lot of your segues. Like, uh, how are you Scottish? You're wearing blue right now, I'll give you that. I have never once ridden a Segway. And, of course, our scientist for the evening, Dr. Soon-to-be Professor Ava. Ava, how are you doing tonight? I'm great. Said with all the elocution of a linguistics professor. (laughs) People will write poems of her greeting today. Uh, And we, of course, are broadcasting here from the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. Come on into Madhouse anytime this summer and see some great shows. Come on in if you... Well, not at like 4 a.m. and be closed. That's That's true. That's ridiculous. You need to come during open hours. That's right. (laughs) San Diego, everything closes at 10. That's right. (laughs) We're bitches. Uh, And then when you're not checking out Madhouse Comedy Club, maybe because it's 4 a.m. in the morning, come on and check out our website, which is open 23 hours a day. One hour a day, I take it down. Blue Laws. It's a southern thing. www.thesciencefaction.com for references to all the articles that we talk about here, as well as some that we haven't gotten to. And for now, let's move on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. You know, just realize there's no open mic at 4 a.m., There's an entire drug-abusing audience out there waiting to laugh at our jokes. Right, and the meth heads are known as being really good audience members. The meth heads and the nursing mothers who are also up at 4 a.m. Sometimes they're the same group. Sometimes it's meth head nursing mothers. A lot of range in the jokes you got to (laughs) tell. Oh, man, my sore nipples and every other part of my meth-addled body. (laughs) All right, article number one, simulation stimulation. Elon Musk thinks we're living in a simulation. 
Elon Musk, of course, the founder of Tesla. He is now also doing the Hyperloop. He is undoubtedly a genius. Is he going down the Howard Hughes path? He is might be, yeah. No, not quite, because there is some backup to this. He, he's a really smart guy. He's a, an engineer that has basically used his money for good and is now doing a lot of really cool stuff with it. Things like SpaceX basically creating a private space industry. He's an amazingly intelligent man. And so when he says things like this, it draws a lot of attention, and a lot of people listen to him. So sometimes that's good. In fact, almost all the time that's good because he has a lot of really good ideas about education, about technology, about getting people involved in that at a young age. But sometimes we can also say, mm, maybe we need to be a little bit skeptical about what Elon is saying. Excuse me. Yes, Dr. Jane Goodall here. I couldn't help but walk by, and you've criticized a lot of people who are smarter than you's ideas, I've noticed, myself being on that list. I would not call you smarter than me, Miss Goodall. Uh, I the would... chimps would. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you are somebody who's been a proponent of Sasquatch being real and a couple other things, so while you went out and did a lot of... You don't speak the language of the skunk ape? <laughs> As we said before, I am the epitome of a skunk ape and asterisk. I am constantly have many skunk ape suitors, specifically I... in the Pacific Northwest. Obviously, you did a good job with biological field research, and that should be credited, and all the more power to you. You really revolutionized that field and a way to go, but... Uh, I don't know if you're really on the same genius level that Elon Musk have or you, myself would be. Have either of you, gentlemen, mothered a human-chimp hybrid? <laughs> no, but as far as I'm concerned, neither, neither have you. We've said too much. Please, okay, all right, I'm, fair I'm sorry. Enough. Ignore. I've said, run, Bobo, run. So the basis behind simulation theory is that right now, you, me, everybody listening to this, we're all living in a simulation, in a computerized simulation. We are in the matrix. And who cares? Well, that actually Neo. might be a good point. You know, I, I mean, in this case, apparently Elon Musk cares. Lawrence um, Fishburne. Agent Smith. All of those guys. But they care for different reasons, yeah. but they care. The reason is, and it's kind of interesting, this idea has been brought up by a lot of smart people in a lot of different ways. The idea is... Also, like, 3,000 years ago. Yeah, of course. I mean, in a way, it's solipsism, but just in a modern sense. And so what, it, what they're saying is, hey, look, w look at what we can do with computer simulations now. At some point, we are going to reach a point where we can make computer simulations that nobody can tell that they're in. Holodeck technology. Not even holodeck technology. So though, that's true. So what does true. that mean? What does that mean? That, that means, nobody can tell that we're in a simulation. That means that we might all be literally bits of software on a large computer server someplace in the actual real universe that exists. Meanwhile, the rest of us just think that we're in an actual universe, but we are essentially the Sims from the game SimCity. Or Grand Theft Auto, if you've been reading the news lately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically, we're like computer games now yep. with like flavor and taste and smell and texture yes exactly so it's kind of like we're real stuff that somebody made well no we are literally software programs running through a computer well software programs cannot have texture why not all all you the inputs you still need to you still need to i mean sure you can be a software program that applies to a real thing right but you still have to be a real thing so basically you're kind of like a brain attached to a body which is kind of what we are. In a way, I mean, what they're saying is that you don't need the brain, you don't need the body. This is all information on some giant computer server somewhere in the real world. So, so imagine yourself as a character in a computer game. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all you are is a Contra. character. Yeah, you're a character in a computer game that happens to think you are real and the universe around you right. is real. So if I'm a character, so let's, let's talk about computer games now, right. right? Like I'm a character in a computer game and I'm mm -hmm. eating a sausage. Right. Uh, no, I won't. I'm, I'm a vegetarian. Oh. I'm eating a... a I like how, example, then. By the way, I like how this is a simulation. She's like, I won't kill a simulated cow. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm eating a simulated apple. So what's happening in my simulated computer game right now is that the pixels of the apple just disappear in close proximity to my mouth, so it looks as if I'm eating it. Or the construct of the universe, the game that you're in, follows certain physical rules, which we call the laws of nature, the laws of physics here, and the rules are exactly as they would be. As you eat, you know, the, the simulated Ava gets simulated nutrients that go down into their body, and they simulate growing and the whole nine yards. We all follow the same but rules. As, as soon as we follow the laws of physics, we're following the same laws of physics as 
probably the simulated the simulator uses, right? Not, not necessarily, if, because there could be a world with vastly different physics that's running a computer program of this universe mm-hmm. with the physics that we know. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just picturing who would buy these games. This is the one thing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, uh, like for Ava, uh, uh, motherhood, motherhood eight. Uh, uh, <laughs> now you have to wake up two kids. <laughs> Uh oh, soccer practice. These little, these terrible mini games people are playing. Like for me, uh, drunk alcoholic comedian, uh, late night suicide sessions 101. Uh, how much whiskey can you pound before you pass out? 4 a.m. stand up show. <laughs> the idea would be that it is a computerized simulation. So we are all. So basically, so where's the difference between simulated stuff, which mm-hmm. I feel is kind of like making a fake world with a lot of allowances? Yes. Right? Like, so we al- we think that the computer games are great because we allow for them to not be real. The, it's virtual re- reality because we allow for them not to have physical substrates, 3D substrates in the world that follow the laws of physics, right? So in that way, they're simulated, but they're not even fake. So fake would be something like a model of, you like I have a 3D printed model of Bobby, right? And that's a fake Bobby, right? A simulated. It's more Bobby. interesting than the real Bobby. Let me assure you, it's true. Uh, it's super good shape too. Yeah. So the the question is like, where does fake end and where does simulation begin? And that's kind of you know, fake is an arbitrary concept when you start mm-hmm. thinking of it that way, which is true. I fake many a thing. <laughs> No, it's not what you think. She's very unqualified to be a professor. She's it's talking about a lot of her work. <laughs> hey. Linguist? That's not even a real science. We all bought it on this show. Well, the idea that they come up with is this, which is for every real universe you imagine. So let's pretend this is the real universe. Let's pretend we are in a real, actual universe. At some point, we're going to get to the point where we can make a bunch of these simulated universes using computers. When We get to, we are already doing that, right? right Except but- that they're not... We're talking about more advanced ones that are indistinguishable, essentially, from so that from inside. Real. From the inside, they are, yes. So if you could do that, then if we get to that point, we can make billions of simulated universes for every real universe there is. So, so why does he think this is the case? I mean, you can dream this up. I still don't think that it makes any sense when you, when you think hard about what it means to be a simulation as opposed to a physical thing. I understand the argument, but why does he think that we would be in a computer simulation. Because the argument would be, and this is the argument that's been made before, it's a million to one odds that we are in the simulated universe as opposed to the real one because for every real universe that exists, eventually they develop the computer technology that will allow them to make millions of simulated universes. So statistically, it's argued, it is much, much, much more likely that we are in a simulated universe that arose from a computer program in some kind of real universe that existed previous to it. Just throwing this out there, what if this is a Mormon supercomputer and it's ensuring that everybody gets their own world universe? They're fulfilling a promise made by Joseph Smith years ago. Elon Musk, space Mormon. (laughs) So the laws of physics that we have here, are they also invented? I mean, in the simulation theory, then yes. Oh, they, they can be programmed any which way you want I when see. you make a simulation. I see. Um, so it is, it's an interesting idea. I think it's a little short-sighted, especially when they list stats the way that I just described it to you, for a few reasons. One is, we don't know that there's only one real universe. In fact, a lot of physicists think there are millions, if not infinite amounts of universes in the multiverse, meaning that your stats doesn't necessarily work out. Because if in those millions or infinite numbers of, of universes in the multiverse uh, occurs, then all of a sudden those stats go out the window. The second you put infinity into a stat, it goes away. And so you couldn't say, oh, it's a one in a million shot. We must be in a simulated universe because we don't know how many possible real universes there could be. Does this tie into quantum physics in the same way that uh, the reason it obeys different physical laws is because it's because we're seeing through the programming. We're seeing, we're seeing, into the, we're seeing the robots world. Yeah, every time you get a deja vu, that's an example of the simulated universe. So I I find this much less interesting than the old question of whether what we perceive is the real world or just something that our brain cooks up. Well, right. It kind of flips on its head the old Descartes idea of I think, therefore I am, because it says I think maybe I'm not, you know, because computers can think too. So just because you think, it does not mean you are. I think chimps are hot. (laughs) Thank you, Jane. (laughs) Because I I left my keys, came back, I'm, I'm going now. 
<laughs> and it's related to this philosophical concept of solipsism, which is basically that the entire universe could just be in your head. You know, think of it this way. You could have, be having a dream that the entire universe is encompassed within because uh, you have no idea whether or not everything you see, touch, feel, know is real. You have no idea if the people you meet are real. Technically, they could be figments of your own imagination. That's the idea of, I think, For some people, I, I would prefer that. That's right. Bobby wakes up in the middle of the night, checks the NASA satellite live feed to see if the Earth's on the back of a turtle <laughs> every night. Oh, sorry, babe, I had a bad dream again. Same dream. Many turtles, Damien. <laughs> Many turtles. <laughs> So, yeah, it, it is an interesting idea, and it's an interesting philosophical exercise, but it comes back to the same problem I have with solipsism and why I would kind of suggest people not spend too much time worrying about this, which is if it is true, there's nothing you can do about it. And if not, I mean, you might as well live your life as if you're in the real world, regardless of whether or not you are, because all we know is the possibility that we could be in the real world or we could not. But either way, we're following the same rules. We're following the same guidelines. We're having the same experience. So then, like you brought up, Professor Ava, the real and the fake are essentially indistinguishable. And why bother about the distinction between indistinguishable things? And please don't confuse solipsism with polypism is where you don't get your polyps removed because you it's like it's like where you Indians, don't want to get your you, you know you're over 40 but you don't want to get the finger up there it's like how indians per, like worship cattle well polypsists worship <laughs> anal polyps i just feel bad for elon actually because it's like you know somebody could have told him it's this old joke of how one thorough literature search destroys the scientific ideas of a whole generation well, I mean, listen, he, he could be right. We could be living in a simulated universe, but my... That's res- true, but it's like, I, I, it's, it's one of these things, right? Now, now everybody's making a big deal of it because he had this yes. great idea that we could be living in a... Well, he do- didn't have it. He, he adopted it. Exactly. So that's, yeah, yeah. The, that's my whole point. Did he reference anyone? Yeah, yeah. And there are there are. Okay, prominent- you don't I grant you that. Sorry. Yeah. There are prominent scientists and, and prominent computer scientists who have put this theory forward for quite some time. Um, there, there Did he are- acknowledge them? There, yeah, and there are a lot of writings on this, and he does you know, kind of bring up these stats as an idea and, and all that stuff. Like I said, whether or not it's real or fake, if it's indistinguishable, then it's indistinguishable. The distinction ceases to matter, and you might as well live as if it's real. It's indistinguishable, like an orgasm from a human male or a chimp male is indistinguishable. No, those are not. Jane, Jane, but here's Jane the... you are getting out of hand here. But, I'm sorry, but, if I'm I Wallace. have an interesting question. There is a distinction between a fake orgasm and a simulated orgasm. But in the simulation, either can happen. Or in real life, either could happen. That's true. And in both a chimp is a viable <laughs> idea. This is not a popular oh, idea. God damn it. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to article number two. Sasquatch. <laughs> so who does Elon think programmed the Brexit? Well, that it doesn't necessarily even have to program. They could set the universe going, uh, like the deistic idea of how the universe works, which is there's some kind of god that sets the laws of physics and sets the the starting conditions, and then they allow the computer simulation to play out. I think it was some angry teenager. <laughs> Just sitting there, Mom, you'll never control me! That's it! Screw you, England! Double click on Western nations, increase stupidity to 51%, <laughs> press enter and watch the magic. <laughs> All right. I think they should be out of the of the Euro. I mean the the Euro soccer. Are you following this? No? Well the, nobody follows soccer. What? We're, we're, that's I mean we have real sports here. Why would we do Six that? o'clock, nine o'clock, twelve o'clock. What I don't in the morning Dude, it's the biggest soccer tournament on right now. But that's like saying this is the best child porn I've ever seen. I have no interest in watching that. <laughs> You'll have to excuse him, Doctor. Yes, Richard Dawkins. Well, Jane, you're here. Here he is. Hi, Richard. Yes, uh, he's not a big soccer fan. Uh, he's not going to follow the-, the Manchesters, the Worcesters, the Portchesters, the Manchesters. That's a real one. All right, let's move on to article number two, Pyramid Scheme. Uh, new research shows that the pyramids are not as perfect as previously thought. In fact, the Great Pyramid at Giza actually has a length discrepancy between its east and west sides. This is interesting. Now, it's not a huge discrepancy. In fact, is it lopsided now? Uh, sort of, in a way. So if the east and west sides are about 230 meters long, so pretty long, but with approximately 
14 centimeters differential between them. Now, you might say, well, that's a really small percentage, which is true, and it's very, very close. But the fact that these are not mathematically perfect is an issue because while close works for things like building a road, it doesn't work for things like architecture. Architecture essentially needs to be exact, especially with giant monuments like this. So as they were building up, they had to compensate for this by building the other levels differently to compensate for the fact that one end is essentially smushed. But that's something that has been that's been done often in architecture, right? Because it yes. gives a more interesting perspective to have not perfectly 90 degree, degree angles. It can be done purposely. This so it's was perfect. <laughs> Shut up. It's perfect. It was a purpose. This was not done the on purpose. The other explana explanation, though, is that the workers were on strike. So, so they, they had they to finish. Scabs. Exactly. Yeah, they okay. had to, they they had to finish people. quicker. I can already picture the uh, the emperor coming out with his ruler. Listen, uh, you have served uh, me. Pharaoh. Very, the pharaoh. Listen, uh, you have served your pharaoh uh, very admirably, but I'm looking at this, and you're going to have to be beaten and tortured and family killed and raped. <laughs> and like, as he's being beaten, come on, who's going to notice? It's 14 fucking inches. Who's going to notice? <laughs> centimeters. <laughs> 14 centimeters. Thank you, I'm going to mansplain you to death today, my friend. Well, By the way, I also, well hung. everybody's coming on the little things nobody's commenting on that that somehow a Russian person is the pharaoh of Egypt as in Egypt uh, is the Moscow of the Middle East uh, we call it little Moscow it's a regional thing don't ask anybody unless they're in Egypt uh, so as they built up they had to compensate for this by building the top levels in different ways now this was covered up when the actual many pe people have to compensate for 14 centimeters <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, the, that's the difference between O and an auto yeah. all right in a right Dr. Ava and they actually you're right and they did it the same way that guys do it, which is like wearing really thick jeans. Uh, the original... Cucumber in the pants. Yeah, the pyramids, <laughs> as you think of them, they, they didn't used to look like the way you think of them uh, when you see them now. They used to be covered in a layer of limestone that essentially made them this very flat, capped off thing. We now see them as kind of these little steps. You know, that, that's because the finished stone has all been taken off to use for other projects, but they, they covered up the problems by covering it up with that limestone. How do we know that they covered it up in a way that it seemed perfect? Maybe they did all kinds of crazy shit on those Maybe. Limestone. They spray painted a tarp. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking more of like, wait, 14 centimeters is not enough. Right. Let's make it even crazy. Oh, You're a greedy it. girl, Ava. Yeah. <laughs> Why it is important is because we have these myths. Now, this is a 4,500-year-old pyramid. This is one of the largest pyramid in Giza, but it's also one of the oldest. Do you think the, it could be due to aging? No, 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 no. And, I mean, stone does not age in a way that would make that happen. But what we do know is this helps support things that archaeologists are kind of familiar with and we get drilled into us a lot during our schooling but is kind of misperceived in the general community, which is we have this myth of perfect ancient cultures, lost knowledge, things that, you know, oh, man, these guys were so much more advanced and we'll never know. No, they were really advanced for their time. It's really hard to build a pyramid. It took a lot of math. They did a really good job. But guess what? They weren't perfect. They, they used to kill women perfect. because you couldn't get an erection. Like that's, <laughs> that used to be that everybody was a witch. Yeah, things used to be much better, but it doesn't mean they were perfect. <laughs> Uh, what does perfect mean? Like, would have been? Would do, do you think it would have been more perfect if those fourteen centimeters weren't there? Yes. I mean, who knows what was there? Maybe there was something in the way. Yeah, but the, the the point is, they did not. It's not as perfect as we make it out to be. If you're a fan of wild pagan sex, I would disagree. Right. Yeah, with this prude ass society did, we live uh, in. What? what? <laughs> wild pagan sex. It's where you have sex with a Pegasus. What are you not getting about this? With a Pegasus. It's a winged horse. It's like you've never been to school. But the Pegasus isn't even Egyptian. He's trying to when a horse is behind me, I don't ask questions about where the horse is from. I just sit there and cry out in pain and orgasm loudly. And the only thing he can replace it now is with his wild pegging sex. And that also kind of comes back against those ideas that, that people have of these ridiculous, like, oh, it's all aliens. The reason the Egyptians did what they did is they had help from aliens. They had help from outside cultures. They had help, from, Ad <laughs> they had help from Atlantis. They had all these things. We try and mystify these cultures when, in fact, they were incredibly intelligent, scientifically advanced cultures that were not perfect. And there is nothing perfect about what they did. We can see these minor imperfections for what they are, which is something that got really close but not all the way there. Do the people who see that look at modern day Egypt and go, wow, how far <laughs> they've fallen? Right. They're like, look at this perfect society. They do. There's a lot of, there is a lot of ideas like that. If you look at Von Donegan, who of course wrote Chariots of the Gods, which was the idea that aliens came down and helped the Incas and the Mayans so and the Egyptians. why should the aliens be more perfect than the Egyptians? Because if we built a pyramid now, we wouldn't have that 14 centimeter discrepancy. We can do that very easily now. In fact, if so you would have built a pyramid in the Middle Ages, you wouldn't have that discrepancy. 
I mean, they had the technology. Do you think that aliens care about, about geometry? Yes, I think of course they, they care about geometry. Aliens? <laughs> of course. How do you know? Because <laughs> I talked to a shitload of them. They love geometry. <laughs> I'm surprised, I am surprised they even have to take that in, yeah. in, in school. I that seems like very low level. Wait, I mean, aliens, all they care about is the booze. That's why they came down. Oh, and anal probing. <laughs> Oh, you're you're an anti-alienite. Like Why don't you go build a wall, Ava? Wait, I am an alien in this country. <laughs> That's true. I'm Bobby's not anti. Bobby's not an alien, but I was probed by an alien who took on Bobby's form one time. Uh, yeah, we'll go with that. Um, <laughs> it also brings back other issues like uh, the pyramid at medium, spelled a little different than the medium we're used to. M-E-I-D-U-M is an example of a failed pyramid in Egypt. It was one where they tried to build one, and they fucked up, and it essentially collapsed. It also goes right in the face of the, the whole perfect construction or perfect architecture theories. They tried and they failed things. Then they got it better and they got it really, really good, but they weren't perfect. And we have to get away from the idea of exotifying other cultures to the point where we think somehow they had magical abilities. Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Pharaoh, sir, um, we're off by 14 inches, but uh, you wanted the mummy chamber, you wanted the uh, pneumatic dart gun, <laughs> there was just no way to make it work with uh, what you gave us. Because this giant boulder we gotta put in here to come after <laughs> intruders, what are we supposed to do? Uh, what if we just uh, filled it all in? And uh, what if uh, we didn't uh, put me in the tomb when you, when you died? What if that happens. That's what's really making it lopsided. It's all the architects we have to shove in here. So maybe uh, we just uh, we have only one. That, maybe we just need one architect, like uh, Jones over there. <laughs> all right, guys, let's move right on to podcasts. Podcast, podcast, motherfucker. All right, this is our podcast segment we haven't done in a while where we recommend a decent science podcast that's out there you might want to check out. This, you say that, but this entire bit's just a hand job to Joe Rogan. Every time Bobby puts this on, he just quietly touches himself while saying how great Joe Rogan is. We talked about Skeptoid and Radiolab. We have mentioned Joe Rogan occasionally, but I do think it's important for people to recognize he isn't anti-science the way people think he is, and he actually contributes a lot to general scientific knowledge in the public. You spend 10 minutes talking about his ground game each time. <laughs> He's got a black belt in jiu-jitsu. What do you want? He's really <laughs> Really good. So uh, this podcast, I, I stumbled upon in an interesting way. I was actually looking at our podcast, Science Faction, and in Stitcher... They'll Did you say this, Doc, yourself? Yeah, sometimes I look and I'm like, oh, he's so Bobby's hot. I wonder what he's himself. doing right now. Did you leave a comment? Because that's one of the few things you could <laughs> do true. as a listener that would really help. Go on iTunes and leave us a comment, guys. And when I was looking through the podcast recommendations on Stitcher, I looked at our own podcast and the recommendation of what other listeners liked who liked our podcast. And one of them was called You Are Not So Smart. I love the title. And it's a podcast that centers a lot around logical fallacies. So since we have started doing that in our own podcast, I thought it'd be interesting to check it out. They do a much more in-depth job of looking at individual logical fallacies and analyzing them and explaining them. So if any of the little tidbits we give at the beginning of our episodes about logical fallacies get you interested, go check out You Are Not So Smart, and they will go much more in-depth on it. Which also means you can just fast forward to the first five minutes of our show. Yeah, like, totally. You're not going to learn anything new. Well, you miss a few uh, dick jokes. Apparently, chimp dick jo jokes at this point. But Dr. Jane Goodall left. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. Sorry, forgot my purse. Uh, the central theme of You Are Not So Smart is that people are unaware of how unaware they are. Basically, he goes into a lot of things like logical fallacies on how people make mistakes in reasoning. And it's a great podcast. I listened to a few episodes. It is fantastic. I highly recommend if you have any interest in not only logical fallacies, but basically making mistakes in reasoning and how they can lead you to bad conclusions. I recommend you go check it out. Perhaps really, really interesting one. <laughs> You know, it might be a snake eating its own tail, but I've never heard you cover this podcast in the podcast section. I we did we... cover a podcast that had the same name, if you remember, a different science faction. I never heard you once talk about the wonderful character work by that Damien comedian. No, I wouldn't. That nerdy science guy who loves dinosaurs. God damn it. I like that it. lovely doctor with a German accent, Naomi. <laughs> All right, guys, let's move right on to I Call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. How did it go, Damien, the past two times? Uh, I just won. He, I'm not going. just. He won once two weeks ago. Yeah, but then a lot of other ties where I got every answer right, but I where still lost, lost because lost. this game is yeah, a lot like of just, losing, a lot just, of mostly losing, just made to fist me. Yeah, you're, you're gonna win today. If you Don't guys, you give it to me. Yes. The chimp gives it to Dr. Jane Goodall. 
<laughs> if you guys don't know about I Call BS, it's the game where I read four science articles and my panelists compete to see which ones are true and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Huh. Yeah, ready to, uh, to start my win streak, my improbable win streak. <laughs> it is very improbable. It's, it's pretty probable when I'm here. Actually. All right, article number one. <laughs> A new article suggests Aborigines were not the first Homo sapiens to occupy Australia. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science, but it would revolutionize Australian racist slang overnight. So wait, we need to hate somebody more than the Abos? <laughs> I don't know what to do here. I think, by the way, Abos is actually a racial slur in Australia, so I apologize to all our Australian Aborigine listeners. And, of course, Dr. Ava, what do you think? We don't lose it every time a British person says fag, okay? <laughs> kind of revealing about yourself, aren't you there? <laughs> Yeah, maybe I shouldn't say anything for a while so that Damien gets yeah. out his true colors. Now, excuse me, I have to drop the N-word about ten times. It'll um, be funny the tenth. It wouldn't. I think this is science. It sounds highly plausible to me. All right. Article number two. For the first time ever, scientists have discovered a contagious cancer that can spread between different species. Damien, is this science or bad science? Excuse me. I was walking by. I'd like to take this answer. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Yes, Miss Goodall. (laughs) She's taking my answer. I'm the one who should be offended if anything. Yes. Thank you. This is science. But if you are going to call love cancer... Then I hope the whole world dies of cancer. Of course, because as you have made very clear, you you spread your love between the species. Look at my beautiful child Bobo swinging from the lamps. Do you want a world where he can't go to school and rip the faces off other children? I do want that world, yes, thank you. (laughs) And Dr. Ava. I think it's science, but it's actually not a cancer. It's an STD, but nobody's funding intra-species STD research, so they had to brand it cancer. That's true. It would be funny to try and fund it because you have to then put out the ad in the newspaper like, you like fucking dogs? <laughs> <laughs> and Bobo Goodall grew up to be a venture capitalist who invested heavily in interspecies STDs. And interspecies porn. That's how he made... <laughs> <laughs> kind of a sleaze ball. Yeah. Uh, article number three, an ancient Korean skull has been found, but has been found to be mysteriously elongated. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, but that wasn't the most concerning part about the skull. It was that it still had its stupid fucking haircut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not racist at all. And Dr. Ava. Was it kind of like in China they used to wrap children's feet, right, so that they wouldn't grow? They did do that in China, yes. So maybe somebody just wrapped the wrong end? I can't answer that. You're you're asking me. I am a blind rapper, and it means something very different (laughs) today than it did in ancient China. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's going to be science. All right. Article number four. Researchers announced the reversal of Alzheimer's symptoms for the first time ever. Damien, is this science? Or bad science. This is science, but it didn't go as well as you'd think. I remember everything. My family's dead. I survived a war. So it was actually bad news that that guy got his memory back. My uncle touched me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, kill me now. And Dr. Ava. If I don't think it's the first ever, then I'm going to say it's bad science. All right. Let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. A new study suggests Aborigines were not the first Homo sapiens to occupy Australia. Damien thinks this is false. Ava thinks this is true. And this one is bad science. It confirms that they were indeed. They've been there for at least 60,000 years, maybe even older. Trust Australian racism. (laughs) Well, previous genetic work had been done on an ancient aboriginal skeleton uh, called the Mungo skeleton around Mungo Lake. that is such a fucking racist. I know, I know. I call the Mungo skeleton, eh? Get it? (laughs) It was around a lake that was uh, was of the same name. But it wasn't... Called the Mungo Lake. But the work, genetic work done in 2001 seemed to indicate that these skeletons were not related to modern Aboriginal Australians. And so what they were saying was, oh, man, this looks really old. In fact, this looks to almost be pre-Homo sapien. I bet this kind of 
falls in line with this crazy multi-regionalist theory, which is the idea that Homo sapiens evolved in different places in different parts of the world. You know, it used to be thought a long time ago, ah, Chinese people evolved in China, uh, you know, from, from a different species, and uh, Africans evolved in Africa from a different species, and Europeans evolved in Europe from different species. Convergent evolution. Basically, yeah, and we all became Homo sapiens. That, obviously, we know now is untrue. We all came from Africa. We Homo sapiens spread out from there. It did mate with different species in different areas, but it all Homo sapiens came from Africa. Yes, yes um, as an expert in the field of mating with other species, I'd like to say it is just as erotic as the literature says. Uh, it, the literature says not... You know what? Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, let's... Jane, don't you want to go out for tea? <laughs> I would love to. Bobo, Dr. Ava's taking us out for tea. We have a chimp you simply must meet. Uh, so they did some um, further research on this skeleton that was last researched in 2001, and they found out that the genetic research itself was flawed. In fact, uh, when redoing all the experimentation, they found that indeed these are the precursor ancestors to modern uh, Aboriginal Australians. And these, as far as we can tell, Aboriginal Australians are descended from the first group of Homo sapiens to make it out there at least 60 to 70,000 years ago, though maybe even older than that. On to article number two. For the first time ever, scientists have discovered a contagious cancer that can spread between different species. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. Ah. Very interesting. We've talked before about contagious cancers in things like Tasmanian devils and just recently in dogs. This one is in clams, cockles, and mussels. It's known as disseminated neoplastia, and they found that not only is the cancer spread among individuals of the same species, which we've only recently discovered is possible that cancer can be transmitted between different individuals, it's also passed between different shellfish species. That's pretty impressive. How? Uh, basically, that's even more impressive, because uh, one of the things is these animals, they don't really move. They pretty much stay stationary. They actually think it's being transmitted through seawater from one animal to another. And now like we on reproductive n- cells? Like that they Well, we're not sure exactly what cells are spreading, probably the cancer cells themselves. But when we look at it, we now look at one species that has cancer cells that are from a different species. That's mind blowing. Because it means theoretically we could see this happening in other animals. You could theoretically catch not only a cancer from another individual, but from another individual of a different species. So we shouldn't bathe in the ocean anymore. We certainly shouldn't be fucking chips, Jane. That's what I'm saying. You might be catching some chip cancer. This is one of those situations where the cure is worse than the disease. (laughs) No, no, it's not. It sounds Uh, like somebody who's never tasted forbidden chimp fruit. Very interesting scientific news. We're going to find more and more about contagious cancers as we keep researching them. Very interesting topic. We still haven't found one that goes through human beings yet. But if we do, we might find that it's not limited to human beings or that it came from a different species. Super interesting research coming out. Article number three. An ancient Korean skull has been found, but it's also been found to be mysteriously elongated. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science came out of a 6th century tomb containing the skull of a Korean woman with an oddly elongated skull. Now, was it that she was so busy playing World of Warcraft that she didn't bother to take the wrappings off of her head before the baby died? It was an early version in the 6th century (laughs) of World of Warcraft. But what's really interesting about this is, unlike the Incas, the Mayas, certain North American tribes, or the Egyptians, this elongated skull was not the result of cranial deformation, which, you know, we've seen in those cultures where they put boards on the head of infants and they can actually deform their skulls. This is natural variation that has led to this incredibly elongated skull, which might mean that populations at this time just happen to have oddly, unusually elongated skulls due to some kind of genetic isolation. Very interesting idea. Is it possible that she was just one like Ripley's Believe It or Not skeleton Could be. worshipped? Maybe that's why she was, you know, buried in such a way. Maybe that's why she was so prominent in her society is because she had a sweet ass skull. Maybe I skull- wonder what people are going to say when they exhume Damien one day. <laughs> His prostate is so calloused, it's been petrified. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, maybe skulls were the tits of ancient Korea. Maybe they're like, look at the sweet skull on this one. (laughs) Uh, Very interesting stuff. By the way, they looked and they found through isotope analysis that she had a strictly vegetarian diet, which fits with the time because Buddhism was uh, in Korea at the time. We are being able to tell more and more stuff from ancient skeletons. And this is just one of those really interesting little side notes. By the way, back then, it was more Lord of the Rings-ish. You go far enough away and people looked really, really different. And somehow we wound up on top and we're some of the biggest bitches. Totally. Article number four. 
Researchers announced the reversal of Alzheimer's symptoms for the first time ever. Damien thinks this is true. Ava thinks this is false. For the win, this one is science. Congratulations, Damien, on only your second win in what seems like forever. (laughs) Oh, Uncle Rodney, your hands are so rough. (laughs) A couple of uh, things that we should say. This is a very small sample size. This end size is only 10 individuals, so very, very small. Not to endanger my win, but could you argue that because of the small sample size, Dr. Ava was correct when she said bad science? No, because the, the stu- <laughs> the, it you. still holds true. It just means that we have to look at it a little skeptically. But it's dubbed the Metabolic Enhancement for Neurodegeneration, or MEND. And the treatment involves a 36-point program that includes medication, dietary changes, vitamin supplements, brain stimulation, and exercise, among several other things. That uh, sounds so fishy. Uh, it's, it's really interesting, though, because for the first time, you're actually seeing the reversal of Alzheimer's symptoms. They have them going from what is considered abnormal to normal qualifications. That hasn't happened before. Before now, we've just thought of Alzheimer's as permanently degenerative. You go down, it, the only thing you can do is slow that degeneration. This Did is the they first have a time. placebo group? Uh, yeah, and this and this is the first time we've seen the reversal of that. What makes this even more interesting is they actually have people not only with one, but two copies of the gene that we know causes a lot of forms of Alzheimer's disease. So we're actually seeing people with the genetic markers seeing a reversal of symptoms. One of the reasons this is so interesting is that particular gene, the APOE4, which, cause, which we know causes Alzheimer's in a lot of cases, we can test for it. The reason we haven't been testing for it, like we do for BRCA2, the breast cancer-causing gene, the reason we keep forgetting. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know it's there. I've been studying Alzheimer's a long time. No, we haven't been testing for it because essentially there's nothing you can do. We've thought that since there's no nothing you can do for Alzheimer's disease, why even test for it? You're just giving somebody bad news they can't do anything about, so why even bother testing for it? Now that we think we could do something about it, that might revolutionize the testing for it, too. So we might have a bigger push to test for this disease now that we might have a possible treatment for it. So what should Damien eat? Well, right now, he should, for the first time ever, not eat crow because he actually won a game of I Call BS. Two in a row. And don't eat old brains. That's not how it two happens. in a row. You lost last week. Don't sharpshoot me. I'm the fucking victor. And even though you're about to shit all over my victory, this is my day. <laughs> Mine and Bobo's day. Uh, it's great news for all of us with family histories of Alzheimer's disease, like me. Bad news for all those people with degenerative old people fetishes. That's going to be harder to find stuff on. Yeah, like if she like doesn't look confused while sucking a dick, I just yeah. how am I supposed to come? Oh God! Spoken like the true poet you are. <laughs> <laughs> what, Doctor? Are, are we? Am I alone here? Yeah, I guess. Okay, I'm the only one who watches porn. Just regular good old mom and grandma porn. Mom and grandma senile porn. <laughs> and speaking of fetishes, let's move right on. To Noble Nerds. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where we honor Noble Laureates, the world's most educated virgins. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where a man who never gets traffic tickets from the police due to his generous donations to the policeman's ball. <laughs> Seriously, hand job, blow job, butt job, I do it all. Tells you about other devilish rogues. Today's nerd is American organic chemist Robert Burns Woodard, who is considered by many to be the preeminent organic chemist of the 20th century. Organic chemistry is a particularly challenging field of chemistry because not using GMO chemicals really ties your hands behind your back. (laughs) By the way, uh, the real definition is a field of chemistry that studies the reactions of organic compounds and organic materials, i.e. matter in its various forms that contain the carbon atom. And if you didn't get the joke that they just laughed at, you're part of the fucking problem. (laughs) Yeah, it is funny that people have redefined organic to mean something completely nebulous. Could organic also mean like it's a verb to describe that something's really organy? That's like, true. That's like a, you're very kidney, but I just want that doesn't roll off the top. This deli adjective. meat is very adjective. organic. Adjective. Adjective. <laughs> Thank you. That's why that was a test. Mm-hmm. Woodard won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1965 for his role in the synthesis of complex natural products. And no, I'm not referring to bitchy peat moss tampons or a wise old redwood butt cork. What, what, what would a butt cork be? Oh, like. It's not like a plug. It's like meant to stop you up. Like uh, so, if you really had to go, but you're like on a long drive, it's like it's like a bottle of wine. Just oh, okay. It's made of cork a lot of times. <laughs> It'd be a really painful corkscrew remover. Don't break the cork off inside. That's yeah. all. And if you can't find a corkscrew, don't do the whole just push the cork in. That yeah. that just makes it worse. Yeah. And don't trust any friend who's going to willing to help you uh, push that cork in. By the way. Sometimes I'm sad that we're not recording video because my face says it all. <laughs> 
<laughs> she says, giddy up. <laughs> it's the most aroused I've ever seen a woman's face. <laughs> well, since Jane was in here with that chip. Boo <laughs> boo, get down. <laughs> So by synthesis of complex natural products, I'm referring to organic synthesis, the branch of chemical synthesis that's concerned with the construction of organic compounds via organic reactions. Organic compounds include most sugars, some alkaloids, certain nutrients such as vitamin B12, and in general, those natural products with a large or stereoisometrically complicated molecules present living organisms. Now, if you're like me, immediately after writing that last sentence, I couldn't shake the thought that my time would have been better spent writing a screenplay about two mentally challenged young men, one of whom is new, who assist a college football team. I'd call it Radio 2. Stereo. Or 2 Radio 2. It's a long way to go for that joke. 2 Radio 2 Furious. I will cross the earth for a Cuba Gooding Jr. radio or Snow Dogs joke. You know this. The the podcast has documented (laughs) this. So I have one question. Woodard's colleague and Nobel laureate, Derek Barton, said, quote, the most brilliant analysis ever done on a structural puzzle was surely the solution of the Teresium problem. It was a problem of great industrial importance, and since many able chemists had performed an enormous amount of work trying to determine the structure, there seemed to be too much data to resolve the problem because a significant number of observations, although experimentally correct, were very misleading. Woodard took a large piece of cardboard, wrote on it all the facts, and by thought alone deduced the correct structure for teramycin. Nobody else could have done that at the time, end quote. What we learned from this story is that even the coolest science stories suck ass. So my two science assistants on this show, (laughs) assuming this story makes Robert a LeBron-level baller, what would be an even greater baller move in the field of science? Fucking a chimp. I mean, (laughs) right? (laughs) That's that's more self-sacrifice and also doesn't take a lot of research. You were shitting on Dr. Jane Goodall earlier, but now you're... No, I mean, I respect what she's done for the field. <laughs> I'm raising a chimp child. I don't vaccinate my chimp because I don't want him getting oh, God chimp damn autism. It. God damn it, Jane. That is the other thing I hate about you. <laughs> all right. Maybe doing all this while teaching a full load of courses and advising a bunch of students and doing academic service. Yes, women like us prove we can have it all. <laughs> I li- Jane, I like that you are equating yourself with Dr. Ava. Very nice. And well, I'm a better mother. Look at Bobo. <laughs> Don't doubt that. Uh, thank you very much. This has been Noble Nerds. And thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 128. Hopefully you join us once again next week for Science Faction 129. They don't refer to field research as being in the bush for nothing. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Right.